है धरती तेरी है जहाँ ये तेरा भर दे इसमें रंग हम बरसा नीला अब जोश का Amazon Blitz, Bucha Pias, Nay Rang Se. So good evening viewers. On behalf of FDC, I hereby welcome you all to today's our first module addressing on the vascular and metabolic in diabetes. Dear viewers, the rate of diabetes diagnosis is increasing around the world, including in India. And India has the second highest total population in the world, if we say about diabetes. Around 5 to 10 percent have type 1, and almost approximately 90 percent to 95 percent have two type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is likely that the incidence of type 2 diabetes will rise as a consequence of lifestyle patterns contributing to obesity. Physicians are encountering many of these patients because of the vascular disease are the principal cause of death and disability in people with diabetes. So today we were to take on the today's module, which is very essential in today's scenario. And for today's updation of diabetic updates, we have our guest speaker, Dr. Vivian Fonseca, and the session is moderated by Dr. Sanjay Kalra. Sir. Dear viewers, Dr. Sanjay Kalra is the president-elect of South Asian Association of Federation of Endocrine Societies. He is also an executive editor of Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism and editor-in-chief of Indian Journal, Journal of Clinical Cases and Investigations. He has addressed many sessions at the international level as well as he is an author of numerous published peer-reviewed research papers. Has, his outstanding research background has earned him several national clinical awards. And with this, I hand over the platform to Dr. Sanjay Kaltra, sir, to introduce our guest speaker and, and to take on to today's agenda. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Rahul, and good evening, everybody, all of us who are logged in today. Uh, it's a very special moment for me to be able to introduce Dr. Vivian Fonseca, uh, son of India, but a doctor, a physician, a scientist for the entire world. We speak of Indian innovation, Indian pride, and here uh, we are very proud to introduce Dr. Vivian, an Indian son of the soil, who currently serves on the board of directors of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and also on the board of trustees of the American College of Endocrinology. He has been past president of uh, the ADA uh, Science and Medicine Wing, and he has been editor-in-chief of all the major journals in diabetology. His workplace, his Karam Bhumi is the University of Tulane, but actually his Karam Bhumi is not limited to that. It extends across the United States and across the entire world. Dr. Vivian is an expert in his field and why he is treated as the Dronacharya of diabetes that we learn in the next one hour or so when we listen to him speak about diabetes, especially about how to improve cardiovascular health. Dr. Vivian, warm welcome to India. And Thank e you welcome very much. Again. Thank, thank you very much, Sanjay. I we wish have, I was there. Yeah. Sorry. We have about 10,000 people logged in listening to you. And uh, their question is, uh, would you tell us about your roots, uh, your medical college, what you did before that, after that, and then how did you finally gravitate towards diabetes? Okay, very good. Let me start with that. I, I was born in Pune. I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, went to school and college there. Went back to Pune, to AFMC Pune finished in 1974, went back to Bombay, worked there, did MD. Then I went to England, did MRCP, and came to the United States in 1992. I, I got very interested in solving problems and without doing procedures. I'm not a procedure kind of person, though I occasionally do thyroid biopsies. 
but I, I, I got really very fascinated in solving individual people's problems. And every person with diabetes is different and they have different problems that we need to solve and take a very holistic ex approach to it. Uh, and I, I will try to address that in my talk. So I'm really very happy to be here with all of you. I, I wish I was there in person. I uh, hope that as we get out of uh, COVID, uh, we will be able to meet again with many of our uh, you know, friends and former colleagues. The American Diabetes Association is being held in New Orleans, my hometown, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so it is uh, hybrid. So a lot, we are hoping that a lot of people will come in person. If you do, I'm, sh I'm sure you will we'll meet up over there and I look forward to it. So thanks for sharing your roots with us and thanks for telling us why you find diabetes so fascinating. Now we have 70 million Indian countrymen and women, our countrymen and women who live with diabetes. Each of them is unique. Each of them is different. Uh, Dr. Vivian, it is famously said that if you have four people, four Indians in a room, you will find four political parties, four different affiliations. Four Actually, different five. Opinions. Actually, five. Actually, five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more than that. So the same is true for our people with diabetes. Each of them has different needs, different wishes, preferences, and each of them has to be handled differently. So when you're managing people with diabetes in your clinic, uh, it, it's like a painting. It's like a piece of art, like music. So what comes to your mind? What analogies come to your mind when you are when you are able to successfully handle a difficult diabetes case? Do you feel you know, like you're like M.F. Hussain? Do you feel like you're like <laughs> Lata Mangeshkar? What, what kind of a feeling do you get inside yeah, you when you feel yeah. like I, I wish I was even one small percentage of those kind of uh, people that you talk about. But medicine is an art, very much an art. And all of us have to work with the art of medicine every day, but not forget the science. So today I'm going to discuss the science with you of the background of a wide range of therapies that we have. It's actually become very much more confusing than it used to be because we have to develop a precision approach using a wide range of things. It's not easy. And every patient, you have to try and fit in what they will take. And if you read the guidelines, it's very confusing because you could end up giving somebody 20 medications and they're not going to take it. It's expensive, it's challenging, it's confusing for them. So we need to have a dialogue with our patients, share the decision with them as to what they want and how they're going to get there using the tools we have. So look at my talk as a holistic toolbox. You have many different options. I'm trying to go and cover it in a very rapid kind of way, but hopefully we'll have some discussion about that and try to develop a precision approach, which we are not there yet. We are actually making very big advances in cancer with precision medicine. You have a genetic abnormality and you choose the right treatment. We haven't got there yet, but I think we have some approaches in the guidelines, which I'm actually not going to, to do, but maybe at the end of my talk, I will talk briefly about how to choose between these things. So like you rightfully said, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of confusion in today's diabetes care scenario in the ecosystem. But what Dr. Vivian is going to do for us, and that is why we call him, why we address him as the Dronacharya of diabetology. He's going to convert that chaos and confusion into clarity, into confidence for us. Uh, Dr. Vivian, a uh, warm welcome once again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. And I, I also want to uh, uh, thank uh, ProAdvice for organizing this and Pranjit in particular for approaching me to, to do this. And he asked me to talk about cardiovisceral metabolic health. It was a very broad term. And I tried to ask him, what, what is it that I could talk about on that in, in 30, 40 minutes? And it's actually very challenging. So forgive me if I'm superficial in some things, but we will come back to try and pull this all together at the end, maybe in the Q&A session. So let me share my screen. So this was the title that I was asked to talk about, vascular and visceral metabolic health. And I'm actually going to start with the visceral metabolic health, which I take to mean the interaction between obesity and what it does to metabolism. And then ultimately down the, at, towards the end, try to focus on uh, what it impact it might have on the, on the heart and also on the kidneys, which are actually very important. So this is a somewhat old slide now coming from the uh, IDF, which highlighted the epidemic, which 
was already by then reaching a peak and they were projecting it. I think the projections are quite uh, near to being accurate. Increasing in, the, in uh, North America and Europe, but not at the same rate as the way it was increasing in Southeast Asia and in Africa. And this has led to a huge increase, as you pointed out, in the people with diabetes, a huge cost issue. Uh, you know, people don't think about, they think it's not like ca cardiac procedures or dialysis in terms of uh, acute expense, but the chronic expense of this and the challenges in management are very, uh, very high. So a fundamental issue was diabetes. And I point out before we got hit with the diabetes epidemic, we started with the obesity epidemic. And these are two very uh, important maps that show the prevalence of obesity. You see one or two states or maybe four or five states with high levels many years ago. And then within a 10 year period, it reached the point where in only one state in the US was the uh, prevalence of 10% of or less. And that the a number of uh, states having more than 20% of obese people uh, was huge. And it has increased since then. And with that came, uh, uh, an epidemic of diabetes. And when you go back and look at what impact that has, as the BMI goes up, your risk of mortality goes up dramatically. And we see a lot of people in this 35, 40 and plus range where the mortality is more than doubled. Now, I want to point out one difference. Much of what I'm talking about relates to figures from and data from Europe and the United States. And it's different in India. A BMI of 25, is here classified as being between very low and low risk. In among Indians, it is not the same. Across all Asians, actually, it is a lower level. And actually for that, we need this has changed in the guidelines and now we define obesity at lower levels of BMI. And we need to recognize that. I think one of the issues with obesity is the fat and its location. And it's a big problem and I'll keep coming back to that. There are multiple health consequences. We are focusing today on diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but it also causes things like stroke, sleep apnea, degenerative joint disease, and, and, and also cancers. So if you look at the medical complications of obesity, they start off initially by driving lipid abnormalities. These uh, lipids spill over from fat tissue into the circulation, as well as accompanying increase in sodium, you have hypertension and prediabetes, ultimately diabetes. And the pathway that we have traditionally focused on is towards cardiovascular disease, which we are going to talk about today. But there are other consequences that many people suffer from. PCOS, sleep apnea, motility disorders. Uh, we are also seeing a dramatic increase in fatty liver. How much of that will translate over to cirrhosis? We don't know. We are watching that carefully but it does have an impact on the diabetes. There should be an arrow here because much of insulin action is actually in the liver and we miss that. And this fat in the liver reflects fat in the heart, fat in the muscle and fat in the pancreas. So a few years ago, uh, uh, obesity was recognized as a disease. So what class, what I, there's a lot of controversy about this. When is something a disease or just a lifestyle thing? And a disease involves impairment of normal functioning of the aspect of the body. It meets that criteria. It has characteristic symptoms and signs. It meets that. And it results in harm or morbidity. And I, I also, I think maybe we can reverse it as well or treat it. And what a fundamental abnormality here is energy balance with signals that are deranged. And this is another thing that we are recognizing now scientifically. There are signals from the GI tract that tell people to stop eating and that gets abnormal. Uh, it affects the, the centers in the hypothalamus in a very different way. Yeah, and the same thing about uh, other signals from fatty tissue and so on that are, that are deranged. So to look at it from a perspective of pathophysiology, we have increased fat deposited in the wrong places that release certain hormones called adipokines uh, like TNF-alpha and IL-1, IL-6. And these flow out uh, and get into the wrong tissues, the liver, the fat, where they decrease cardiac function. Uh, we can recognize it just by lipid measurements and it leads to atherosclerosis and diabetes. So fat is not just a storage place. Fat is an active 
endocrine organs secreting large number of things that drive inflammation, drive uh, uh, insulin resistance, and also contribute through angiotensin, angiotensin, uh, uh, renin angiotensin system, uh, high blood pressure as well. We try to pull this all together many years ago by saying that insulin resistance is the fundamental abnormality in diabetes, and it has many manifestations, obesity, hypertension, glucose intolerance that we recognize, but we can also recognize it through high triglyceride, low HDL, certain clotting abnormalities. And we try to give it a name. We call it metabolic syndrome, although that's very hard to define, but this is the NCEP's definition. Uh, obviously for uh, Asian populations, you need to have lower uh, values on, on uh, waist circumference and so on, but the values for blood pressure uh, and glucose, et cetera, remain the same. And moderate changes in waist to hip ratio uh, matter because it increased mortality uh, a lot. So many years ago, I was very interested in this concept of clustering of risk factors. And uh, the traditional risk factors are hypertension, lipids, obesity, and smoking with diabetes. And you know, if you just address this, you will be taking care of 95% of the problems in your patients. But what about the rest? And we spend a lot of time doing research in things that are called non-traditional risk factors. They have insulin resistance, the endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, et cetera. And uh, one of these is actually really entered the mainstream, and I want to emphasize the importance of testing for proteinuria, microalbumin urea. Small amounts of protein in, in the urine tell you your patient is at high risk and you need to intervene. Uh, and one in, in, interesting one that I added to this slide, it wasn't in my original article, but it's being recognized now, is lipoprotein A, which is also a risk factor independent from LDL, and it has been shown recently to be high among A Indians, A South Asians, and is a very strong um, a biomarker of uh, cardiovascular risk. And you, you may want to start thinking about this as we try and identify what is the problem in people like A in India. So to get back to the issue of adipose tissue, it sets up inflammation uh, and you can test that with, I don't recommend testing things like CRP, et cetera, because in people, with uh, diabetes and complications, most of people have abnormalities here, but it does end up causing cardiovascular disease through plaque stabilization. So what is the bottom line? What do we do? I think we need to control weight. And it lay, you know, weight loss can be very beneficial to your patient financially and to your healthcare system financially. So what are, what are we doing in practice? And the problem is we're not doing very well. A lot of people don't actually have their BMI evaluated. We don't diagnose obesity well. We don't counsel our patients, even though they may have risk factors. This is data not long ago from a, a, a large survey done in the United States. There are many guidelines that have been uh, 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 presented. The National Heart Lung Blood Institute has put out guidelines about, you know, everybody needs uh, advice on behavior and physical activity. We'll get into that. A few people may need pharmacotherapy. And then we use a lot of surgical techniques that I will discuss. At ACE, we took uh, a slightly different approach. We wanted to uh, stage our patients with obesity in a slightly different way, those who have cardiometabolic disease and those who have biomedical complications. And actually, there's a lot of overlap with, with both. And we need to take our patients with a BMI over 27 and stage them into high risk, low risk, and medium risk. Taking the low risk, everybody, most people will need some lifestyle modifications, but intermediate risk, you can start choosing therapies and ultimately for very high risk, maybe consider surgical procedures. Another group of people that needs intervention because they're at high cardiometabolic risk is people with prediabetes. There are millions of these people out there. They're not getting the intervention they need. And the intervention is not just to prevent diabetes, but also to prevent cardiovascular disease. The glucose keeps going up, they get kidney disease, they get heart disease, and all of them need lifestyle interventions. So what is the treatment? The three uh, uh, things to this tool that I've already mentioned, but they, we, we don't actually do that very well. <clears throat> we, what we need is more than diet, it's behavior modification. 
what unfortunately is really sustainable. There are some drugs that are available, but their efficacy is modest, adherence is low. We have new injectables with GLP-1, again, adherence is, is very low. And we have bariatric surgery as an uh, 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 adjunct. So I want you to look at things very holistically in terms of lifestyle change. And uh, this slide is taken from a very recent guideline we have put out uh, uh, on cardiometabolic health that is published in a few months ago in the Journal of Diabetes and its Complications, of which I'm an editor and I'm an author on this paper. You can look it up and you can download it uh, 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 from the journal for free. So. There are many elements to lifestyle therapy. The take home message is any effort is worthwhile. Give the patient some nutritional advice, modest physical activity, increasing walking a small amount, sleeping better. We often neglect that. Cutting back on alcohol and smoking and trying to address mental health. All of this together, I mean, you see the very nice yoga pose. Uh, the patient is sitting in comfortable. This is the fundamental of the treatment that we need. Modest weight loss is what most people need. And for that, you need a calorie deficit. And I want to emphasize just calorie restriction alone, no matter what the micronutrients is, there are many fashionable diets. People want a uh, low carb keto diet. They all work, but people need to stick, or stick to it. And over time, uh, you know, after you know, one year study showed that all these diets work equally. It's sustaining the diet that, that is important. So the US government put out these guidelines saying physical activity, not necessarily exercise. Simple thing like walking uh, 30 minutes a day, any kind of exercise is beneficial. And they emphasize that people need to monitor themselves, manage their stress uh, and, and seek social support. Unfortunately, these things don't work long-term well enough. And most people who lose some weight, regain it, and by year two, almost 60% have regained weight. So we learned a number of lessons from the diabetes prevention program. Uh, placebo didn't work very well. You know, about 10%, 8, 10% of these people develop diabetes over uh, a, a year. It's reduced a bit by metformin, but lifestyle, these modest lifestyle changes reduced it even more. Now, here's an interesting finding from there. Weight, physical activity improved a lot initially, and then people start drifting back. And you need to keep reminding them. Just telling people once that baseline is not good enough. You have to keep reminding them about lifestyle change. Now, what about people late in the disease? The Look Ahead trial took people with cardiovascular disease and uh, type 2 diabetes, put in a very intensive uh, uh, intervention, and tried to reduce mortality and uh, cardiovascular disease. And it showed no benefit. Despite the fact that people had lost weight, they were very effective in losing some weight and they increased their physical activity and reduced their A1C and LDL and blood pressure, but it had no benefit on outcomes. And the reason for this is these people were too late. So you need to intervene early. Don't wait till your patient has advanced cardiovascular disease to institute lifestyle therapy alone. It's too little, too late. So we have, the kind of gap here, you have surgical procedures, in, in, uh, a lot of uh, uh, difficult interventions, and you have simple interventions, but in between, there are a lot of patients and what will fill the gap? And a number of medications have come from understanding the, the disease obesity a little better. And I don't have time to go into these various pathways. Suffice it to say that many therapies have become available that address some of these pathways and more and more are, being, are coming into development into clinical trials. And we will be shifting our focus a little bit from just treating glucose to shifting to treat, going beyond that to try and develop agents that address these many abnormalities uh, that develop obesity. For now, we have some agents, a combination of fentamine to pyramate. Locasserin, unfortunately, had to be withdrawn from the market. We are actually using a, an addiction medicine, uh, naltrexone, along with bupropion, uh, 
which is approved for treating obesity. But what's really grabbed a lot of attention is the use of high doses of GLP-1 receptor agonists. And now very soon you'll have a GLP-1 GIP receptor agonist that causes a tremendous degree of weight loss, over like 10, 15% body weight loss with very good improvement in all the cardiovascular risk factors. So just to touch on these very briefly, the combination of topiramate and fentamine allows lower doses and helps with weight loss without uh, avoiding some of the side effects that you would see if you use each individual drug in high dose. And it has a good effect on many of the risk factors. The problem is if people stop taking the medication for any reason, they, they regain weight. And that's the problem with all those uh, drugs. So I won't go and spend more time. Just a little bit about surgery. We currently focus on very morbid obesity. Uh, the IDF a few years ago recommended that maybe, particularly in Asia, you choose uh, surgery even for lesser BMIs. And we, there are many procedures I won't go into. Uh, the one that's become much more uh, acceptable now with less side effect is sleeve gastrectomy. But some people need a full bypass. Uh, there are many studies showing that in people who you can't control their diabetes, bariatric surgery helps in the outcome. And some people actually get what they call remission for diabetes, although you need to, to watch them. And they, they, the uh, duration of uh, benefit can be very long, 10, 15 years, although after about five, six years, you start seeing some weight regain and the diabetes often comes back in those patients. There's anecdotal long-term follow-up showing a reduction in mortality, but there's no randomized control trial, unfortunately. So and other things benefit. The diabetes gets better, sleep apnea gets better. Uh, the lipids improve, but much of lipid abnormalities is genetically determined. And there are long-term complications. So we need to watch out for these, especially vitamin deficiencies and osteoporosis. But it sends, tells us that maybe something in the gut is important for this. There's some signals. We think about microbiome and other things that help with, uh, that might affect uh, how we, we handle food uh, and, and metabolism. And people have been trying to uh, use devices like a liner called endobarrier. There's, we, we did a study a while ago that helped. We're now using uh, that caused some uh, local obstruction and infection. We're now using other less uh, 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 invasive uh, techniques to address the GI tract to try and address uh, diabetes. So let me move on now to a little bit more detail about managing diabetes and its comorbidities, particularly the diabetic heart, which is really very key. So uh, first of all, uh, what about the tests that we should be doing? And this is a controversial area. And I want to point out only two or three that are important. I, I, a coronary artery calcium score is now re-emerging as an important test to do in clinical practice, because it, if it's negative, it tells you your patient is low risk. If it's very high, it tells you high risk, but many patients fall in between, particularly among diabetic patients, but it does tell you a little bit about risk. Uh, a few other tests that we do, albuminuria I pointed out is important and retinal imaging with, uh, for re assessing retinopathy is also very good. Other stress tests and things like that we tend not to do because you get too many false positives and false negatives. And people have been trying to do uh, uh, you know, other lipid particles, LP little a I, that I mentioned and a good foot exam to evaluate uh, uh, neuropathy is important. So let me address each of these very quickly. We have recognized that lower is better for lipids, particularly LDL cholesterol. And we've now come up with the classification based on extreme risk of people who are having recurrent events and extreme plus, that is people who have uh, a second event within two years. And these people need to have their LDL lowered, certainly below 55, maybe below 40. And it's actually possible to do that today with combination therapy. So a statin is the mainstay. On top of that, you could add in ezetimibe that has a modest reduction, uh, but uh, PCSK9 inhibitors are very, very effective in lowering LDL cholesterol by about 60% and help people get to the goals that we have set for the extreme risk patients. What about triglycerides? Very important marker of fat in the circulation. 
uh, fat in the wrong places. And for that, statins are not, they reduce risk a little bit, but they don't lower the triglycerides very well. Uh, we have been uh, uh, using pioglitazone a little bit. It, it can help. But uh, recently, there have been some studies with high-potency fish oil that really helps uh, in this patient, particularly the reduce it study showed the benefit of that. Uh, another risk factor that's important is, is hypertension and managing uh, to get the blood pressure to go. And the goal that we recommend for most people with diabetes is less than 130 over 80. Unfortunately, we're not achieving that in most people. Uh, one of the issues is, how do we do it? Do we do 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure? That's very challenging to do. But more and more, we're recognizing that assessing blood pressure at home uh, is very useful. And now we are using technology with uh, Bluetooth machines that will tell the doctor what the blood pressure the patient is recording at home on the home machine uh, and it, the data sent through the uh, smartphone, a very effective way of managing patients in their own ver environment, just like we do with self glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring. The, the preferred BP lowering agents are clearly ACE inhibitors or ARBs, but diuretics help some people, calcium channel blockers help some people. And occasionally I, I use spironolactone for people with resistant hypertension because it's very useful, if, particularly if the renin is low and the aldosterone is, is elevated. And we keep monitoring and trying to get it as low as possible. What about lowering blood glucose? And we are fortunate here. We have a wide range of therapies. And here it depends on what kind of problem your patient has. If your patient has atherosclerotic problems, they have coronary artery disease or stroke, a GLP-1, or they have obesity, a GLP-1 receptor agonist is probably the drug of choice. And we now have very powerful once a week injections. On the other hand, some people have heart failure as a predominant feature and the data with GLP-1 for that is less good, but the data on S with SGLT2 inhibitors is really excellent. So we try to evaluate whether your patient has reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, but it really doesn't matter. For people with heart failure, an SGLT2 inhibitor is the treatment of choice independent of blood glucose. And the same with chronic kidney disease. There's, it's established now that SGLT2 inhibitor on the top of RAS blockade is a very effective way of slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease. There is some data with GLP-1 receptor agonists, but it's not that good. For coronary artery disease, there's uh, data on pioglitazone is mixed. It's particularly good for stroke. And I, uh, we put it up here, but there are some risks that you need to evaluate. Um, so here's the hierarchy. Overall, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are very good. Are very effective at these people with, with uh, chronic complications of diabetes, but they are expensive. So maybe we should be thinking, what do we do with people who can't afford the expensive therapy and don't have these complications? And for them, metformin remains a very good appropriate choice. For older people where you're less worried about long-term risk of complications, and you want to avoid hypoglycemia, you can still use a DPP-4 inhibitor. And, you know, sulfonylureas do hold up if your patient is not getting uh, 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 hypoglycemia, uh, they can be useful. But if you get your patient, to get your patient to a goal down to 6.5 or less, um, certainly down below seven, you get hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas and insulin that is very challenging to manage. There are other medications that we do use, they're less frequently used, and we need to find the right kind of patient, the right uh, goal, find the right goal depending on their risk, uh, long-term uh, uh, life expectancy, as well as what other uh, comorbidities they may have. So it's a complex process, choosing a more precise way based on what your patient has got, and what their clinical features are, rather than just jumping into any drug. There are a few other things that are, are, are emerging uh, into, into this paradigm of care. For example, does your patient have fatty liver? 
And there are very few treatments that have been shown to work, bioglitazone being one of them, maybe semaglutide or one of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, very little effect of SGLT2 inhibitor. There is a new non-invasive test that has become available, the fibroscan that goes beyond telling you there's fat in the liver. It tells you how much fibrosis that is present in the liver. So you can maybe identify your higher risk patients by doing that. So then you get into the issue of atherosclerosis in a little bit more detail. I mentioned GLP-1 receptor agonists and GLP-1, but that may not be good enough. For a patient who has had a prior MI, the standard of care is to manage multiple things, not just the glucose, but also the lipids, the blood pressure, use an antiplatelet agent, a powerful one, or a, an anticoagulant. There's very good data with some of the ticagliror or uh, an anticoagulant in combination with aspirin. The same applies for patients uh, who have had a, a prior stroke. For people with prediabetes who don't have diabetes yet, maybe uh, these other drugs without the diabetes drugs might help. Uh, if they have diabetes, it's easier to add in a GLP-1 RA or an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, we occasionally uh, consider icosapent, which is the fish oil kind of thing. And the same for peripheral vascular disease. Note that we are very cautious with SGLT2 inhibitors, but we tend to use more aggressive lipid lowering with PCSK9 inhibition. What about patients with heart failure? And here, as I pointed out, you can draw the distinction between a reduced or a preserved ejection fraction. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors work very well, but you may also want to consider uh, uh, a combination of valsartan with a neprolysin inhibitor in some people, uh, blocking mineral corticoid uh, receptor antagonists with spironolactone, and now you have a new one called finerarone. Uh, this can be helpful as well. Uh, these patients really need a multidisciplinary approach involving a cardiologist. What about chronic kidney disease? Your measurement of, uh, uh, of albumin creatinine ratio is critically important. And if your patient has persistent elevation of that or a GFR less than 60, you really need to be uh, targeting that therapy very, and assessing the cardiac risk, assessing the hypertension and the hypoglycemia. We need to control all of these very effectively, uh, induce the usual lifestyle things that I talked about, but use a RAS blockade, get the blood pressure under control, add in an SGLT2 inhibitor, except that you can't use it and the GFR goes very low, the patient is nearing dialysis. However, there's another one or, uh, that's become available in the last one year, finerarone, which is a non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor agonist, a bit different from, from spironolactone, and that helps as well, and we keep targeting albuminuria. So a lot of choices, a lot of things to do in patients with established chronic kidney disease and heart disease that allow us to choose a more precise way of, uh, of dealing with the patient. And some people have multiple abnormalities. They have both heart failure and CKD. And there you need to, again, classify your patient based on severity, choose these various therapies, use them in different combinations, try to keep your patient asymptomatic, and often we have to think about other things that happen in these patients. Uh, do they, is the potassium going up? Do we need to do something about that? Are they, is the GFR declining? What else can we do? Can we get them ready for dialysis? And monitor their biomarkers for heart failure with the BNP, monitor their albuminuria. If the albuminuria is progressing, we need to uh, be more aggressive with the therapy. If the albuminuria stabilizes, maybe they might have a better outcome. And lastly, I want to touch on one important thing, and that is modern technology. We have a lot of technology that we can use in managing this complex disease. There are many validated apps and variables that we are using now. We can monitor things like uh, uh, arrhythmias with an uh, Apple Watch. We're monitoring sleep quality and physical activity, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, heart rate variability. All this can be tracked remotely. Uh, uh, by, by uh, the, your team in your center and alert patients who have problems. 
uh, monitoring blood pressure at home, I already talked about. And another thing that has really transformed how we are managing particularly insulin treated patients, but maybe even others is continuous glucose monitoring, looking at patterns, looking at that, we probably could do a full lecture by itself on continuous glucose monitoring uh, and do that. Now, not everyone can afford that. So what do you do? Uh, we do self-monitoring of blood glucose, but it, the doing it randomly, like where most people do is not very useful. We need to do it in a structured way. Uh, maybe do it five, six times on one day a week. So you get a pattern of blood glucose. So you can uh, know when it's high, what time of the day and change your treatment accordingly. For people on insulin, we use uh, pumps. Uh, even for some people with type 2, particularly if it's linked up with a continuous glucose monitor. And uh, recently come on the market are what are called smart pens, where you add on a cap on top of the pen and it integrates through Bluetooth with your, and via your phone with uh, your remote patient monitoring. It tells you when a patient has taken their insulin, how much they have taken, what the glucose was at that time linked to their CGM. And it's really transforming how we do insulin therapy uh, without a pump. And it's it, it really very interesting uh, use of technology that's driving care. So I, I think I will stop and take questions. I'm sure Sanjay has received a lot through the chat box and we can have a, a, a full discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivian. That was a great uh, exposition. and. You've actually tried to cover the entire body, all the organ systems of the body in half an hour. There is this quote by Rabindranath Tagore, our national poet. And what he says is that uh, the beauty of a flower is lost if you pluck all its petals. What you've done to us today, you've presented a, such a beautiful, such an exquisite flower. And that is a healthy person, a person who is able to maintain health in spite of living with diabetes. Perhaps some people might say able to maintain health because of living with diabetes, because of the discipline that comes along with it. So uh, let's talk about your perception, your philosophy. You've been in diabetes care now for three decades plus. Is the person who lives with diabetes in the year 2022 actually able to maintain herself or himself as a healthy flower, as a beautiful flower? You know, many people do. There are some people I've been following for 20 years who take very good care of themselves. One of the things that I'm trying to do in our care now is actually electronically classify patients. So when we open up the medical record, I can see a yellow, red, or green. Green is for the good patients who don't actually need my care. They need a pat on their back and say, you're doing a great job. You're a role model for everybody else. I want to focus on the patients who get red. They are got things that are not under control. They need more intervention. They need more time because time is limited for all of us. I would rather share my 24 hours of the day in a way that people who need more attention get more attention than the people who need less attention. And, and try to focus on what we can address. And it may not be possible to address everything in one visit. You may need to say, I will deal with this one thing today and deal with the rest later. And you know, together with what is called shared decision-making with the patient, choose the one that the patient is willing to do. I think the biggest mistake we make is now with so many therapies, we just write a prescription and send the patient away and he doesn't want to take it. He's not going to take it. Mm, you're right. So this actually reinforces some something that we experience in India day in and day out. Uh, whatever you are writing, that may be accurate according to the book, according to the guidelines. But is it appropriate for a particular patient? Now, that is a separate matter. And how will you find out? You will find out only if you speak with the patient, if you right. converse with the patient, if you listen to her. If you listen to her, then you might get more insight as to what is appropriate for her. Sir, we have lots and lots of questions for you. You will be reminded of your MD medicine examination. <laughs> and Dr. Sherwari from Maharashtra starts, and he says you've spoken of uh, viscero-metabolic health. You've focused on obesity. But viscera means each and every viscera of the body. So gastroesophageal disease, that is upper GI disease. Is there any association with diabetes? What do you see in your practice? How do you treat it? There is with obesity because we know that hiatus hernia and reflux is much more common. Also high fat food leads to indigestion and you get conditions like Barrett's esophagus. It fortunately doesn't impact 
the diabetes that much other than make people feel uncomfortable. And there is one uh, particular condition which is very distressing is diabetic gastroparesis. It's highly underdiagnosed, not well recognized, but when you do do that and give some motility drugs, the patients we get a lot of relief. Thanks for that. Dr. Pramod Hevrekar asks a question. A metabolic disorder like diabetes or obesity or both of them put together, is it necessary that medication will be required for all? Or is it possible that in a particular subset of our patients, we can manage with diet and lifestyle modification? So I have a very, I get this question quite often, usually from people early in the disease, educated by colleagues, their family members, people I know personally. Why do I need to take this metformin? So I give them the results of the UK PDS trial, where people were randomized to diet or metformin with, with moderate obesity. And the metformin treated group actually had better mortality and heart attack rates than the people who had a lifestyle change. So it's not as if lifestyle was ignored. It's metformin was better, metformin plus lifestyle was better than lifestyle alone. And if you are able to tolerate, now if you don't tolerate the metformin, it's a challenge. But if you can tolerate it, isn't it better to have a healthy, longer life? And that, that I think that convinces most people. And that hit early, hit hard, and metformin, uh, you know, sir, it just, it costs less than two rupees a tablet in India. Yeah, even in the US, it costs $4 a month, which is actually very affordable by everybody. And 60% uh, of all the metformin in the world actually comes from Indian factories, from one particular Indian company, actually. Uh, another question again from Dr. Sarode. Uh, this is a primary prevention. A child, a teenager who does not have diabetes, but who is at high risk because his or her parents have diabetes. What are the specific things that you tell them in your practice? And how do you get these naughty teenagers to listen to you? You know, it, this, this has to in, be, come from a family approach. Everybody in the family needs to be eating healthy. And one of the things that uh, when I go into patients' diet, the question that I often ask, who's cooking the food and who's buying the food? because it has to start at that point. Uh, the same with lifestyle changes and exercise and things. Doing something as a family together makes, makes a big difference as opposed to somebody going out alone. Now, we're all guilty of doing that. I go to the gym alone, but sometimes I go with my wife and sons. Uh, we all go together. It's actually better that way. The trick is a family approach. You are right. And of course, if it's a child, like maybe a four-year-old child, then the data from the obesity care segment says that you have to engage the parents. But if the child right. is six years plus, then you have to engage both the parents and the child. Right. You, you can't force a child into, uh, into healthy living or healthy eating. Uh, the child cannot do that if they see their family doing yeah. bad things. Mm. The, the family is eating burgers or uh, eating pizzas and telling the child to take greens. That doesn't work. Another thing that some of us in India do not realize is this genetic predisposition regarding taste buds. Some of us actually have hypo-functioning taste buds when it comes to sweet. So which means we might end up eating a lot of sweet without realizing that we are eating so much of sugar. Others might have hypo-functioning taste buds, uh, taste buds re related to salt. So you end up eating more salt. And then there are some people whose taste buds are hyper-functioning for bitterness. So we love our green vegetables in India. But there are some children who don't like it because they find these vegetables bitter. Uh, any insights, Dr. Vivian, do you see this? Because you encounter such a wide spectrum of ethnic groups in, in your practice. So, so they actually, this is a very interesting question that is being uh, looked at through what is called nutrigenomics. Uh, NIH is doing a study. I'm the uh, one of the principal investigators in our region. It's called All of Us. We are taking 1 million people and we are doing genome sequencing. And uh, they, if part of the gene, there are genes that are described that tell you whether you like things like uh, 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 cilantro, which is kothmir, or you don't like it. There are people who like it and don't like it based on a genetic polymorphism. It's really very interesting. Some people like chocolate or don't like dark chocolate based on a genetic polymorphism. So you're, what you're going to see in the next 10, 15 years is more studies that identify people's liking and not liking 
uh, uh, and and much of that is, as you say, maybe taste bud, but there's also some degree of central things uh, related to that. Can I just say related to that is satiety. Do, do you feel satisfied with a certain amount of food or not? And some of that relates to the stomach being dilated. We get used to eating big meals. So you don't send the signal. The more, So that's what sleeve gastrectomy does. You, it, it reduces the size so you feel it, but maybe there are drugs that will help to feel the satiety again. You've spoken of all this uh, interconnection, uh, the brain connecting with the bowel, the bowel connecting with the brain and finally influencing carbohydrate metabolism. So a question from Dr. Hubert D'Souza, uh, what about peripheral neuritis? Uh, does diabetes cause peripheral neuritis? Because in his practice, he says sometimes he sees uh, he sees the uh, patients coming into good control and then coming and fighting him, saying that they have developed neuropathic symptoms. Yeah, this is actually well recognized. Uh, if you go back, I I, I had uh, somewhere around 1985, 87, I had published a paper in the Lancet and then also in Acta Neurologic uh, Neuropathica. We did biopsies on people who, following good control, get complications of diabetes accelerating. And we, what we found is that actually you're growing more nerves when you improve the control and that is painful, but it's a short-term thing. The patients get worse and then they get better. This was seen in the DCCT trial as well when retinopathy actually got worse in year two to year three, but by nine years, the difference was very, very favorable in those who had good control. How we explain in uh, our OPD, of course, uh, uh, there is always a competition going on between Punjab and Haryana and Goa regarding who drinks how much alcohol. But what we tell our patients is we are from the sugar cane belt, sir. So what we tell them is that uh, sugar comes from the sugar cane. Alcohol also comes from the sugar cane. So both are sisters. Now you imagine someone who has got an HB1C of 14%, 10%, 11%. The happiest person in Karnal at this point of time would be someone who is drunk on 11 or 14% alcohol. So he is happy. He does have neuritis, but he doesn't know it. It's only tomorrow morning when he wakes up, when the sugar levels come down, when the alcohol comes down, that he will realize that uh, he hurt himself or he lost his wallet. So same thing happens when you are controlling glucose. Glucose is like alcohol. When the glucose comes down, it's only then that the nerves tell you that they are sick. So of course, it's not scientifically 100% accurate, but it tells the patient, yeah, and you're able to give a positive spin to that negative symptom. And you're able to tell him and, and the spouse as well that now we are bringing you out of that addiction, out of that addiction to high glucose levels. So one insightful question coming from Dr. Jagdish Ramchandani. And Dr. Ramchand, Ramchandani has a query. Our target is treating blood glucose because that's what the targets are in diabetes. Does it mean that if I keep my patient's glucose in target within range, I will automatically achieve all vascular targets? you will achieve the targets for preventing microvascular disease. So if you have a normal, near normal glycemia, you will have less risk of getting retinopathy, neuropathy, and, and uh, uh, nephropathy. However, cardiovascular disease is much more broader, has many other factors that are contributing to it, not glucose alone. So there you need to control blood pressure and lipids as well. Uh, that's a good answer, sir, and thanks for that. So, a multifactorial approach. Uh, now, lots of questions coming in on public health and biochemistry. Uh, Dr. Basav Raj from Karnataka says, uh, adulterated food is a big public health issue in India. Uh, do you feel that that is contributing to the epidemic of metabolic diseases? Uh, you know, I, I, it's very hard to answer that question because there is no data. I think that uh, the chances of that are probably very small. You, you cannot adulterate it for every, I mean, the extent of diabetes is so much. And it's, it seems unlikely to me that adulterated food is going to cause obesity. You might get more GI uh, uh, malabsorption uh, and problems like that. So I, I really don't think that that is a, 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 an issue. Trans you, might get a, you might get an individual toxin. We know that there are some pancreatic toxins like, yeah. uh, you know, so, uh, many years ago uh, from All India Institute, there were studies on cassava. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ahuja yeah. and uh, Bajaj had pointed out you get fibrocalcific diabetes in some people. But those are actually quite rare. 
pancreatic diabetes is uh, actually quite common here sir if you look for it it's just that we don't publish our data so but what the, i would suggest is if you yeah yeah, yeah carry on, I, I, no no though, though you must look for that because the treatment is somewhat different yeah. Yeah. So uh, from an Indian perspective, whether you are in North, South, East or West India, if you have a lean adult with diabetes, a lean adult with diabetes, it is not necessary that that person will have type 2 diabetes. Uh, if you find, now this is from a North Indian perspective, if you find that your patient is relatively fair complexion, has a relatively lighter colored hair and eyes, has stigmata of autoimmune disease, is overall more handsome than other men, overall more beautiful than other women, then you will think more in terms of autoimmune etiology, type 1 diabetes, LADA. If the person has stigmata of malnutrition, macronutrient as well as micronutrient, you feel that the hair, the skin, the nails, these are not healthy. If you feel that there are symptoms suggestive of exocrine deficiency, steatoria, flatulence, diarrhea, then do spare a minute to think about pancreatic diabetes. So keep that in mind. And uh, in Haryana, you will find that pan uh, uh, fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes is reasonably common. It occurs more often in rural belt in the poor socioeconomic status. And why it is not reported is because these men, it's usually men, very, very rarely, very, very, very rarely women. These men are just not able to access healthcare. Th that is why uh, you will not be able to sort of uh, uh, understand how frequent it is. Uh, but sir, continuing on with bike mystery and this tough question comes from the Jammu Kashmir from Dr. Uh, Mudassir Hussain. So he says glucose, sucrose and fructose. What is the differential impact on health in diabetes? So the body preferentially uses glucose as a fuel compared to the others. Uh, we have a problem... Uh, it's particularly in the United States, but it may well be prevalent increasing across the world. There's a lot of use of uh, uh, sucrose changes into glucose very easily. Fructose is a problem, it, particularly when you get, de depends where it is derived from. So high fructose corn syrup is much cheaper than regular sugar, sucrose-based sugar. And so it is used very widely in, uh, uh, in processed food, in Coca-Cola, other drinks like that. So that can be potentially a problem because we know from animal studies that uh, if you give high fructose corn syrup, you get more insulin resistant. Very hard and to prove in humans. And if you're taking whole fruits, now that is different. You'll be eating them slowly and the glycemic load is not going to be too much. The glycemic index, of course, will vary from fruit to fruit. But if you're taking that as a juice, that is highly concentrated, especially if the juice is coming in a tetra pack, that will contain a lot of corn syrup. That's and, correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, your opinion on uh, excessive intake of these, these uh, packed fruit juices uh, on triglycerides, on the pancreas, on the liver, what kind of Patients, do you encounter in your practice? So I tell patients a very simple thing. Fruit juice is very effective to treat hypoglycemia. How can you give it to people with diabetes? It's going to go up. Have the fruit. Uh, you know, a simple, simple thing. Uh, people like orange juice for breakfast. If one glass of orange juice comes from six oranges. Nobody will sit and eat six oranges. But they will readily drink a glass of orange juice. So if you, they think about it in that context, they, they hopefully will decrease their intake. Juice is something we should avoid. And that brings us to another question. Uh, this is from Dr. S. N. Rai and also Dr. M. P. Benival from Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan. Uh, they are asking you if you see heat exhaustion in uh, New Orleans. Do you encounter heat exhaustion, heat stroke? We don't because, uh, you know, we, we do see occasionally, but I, we don't see that much because air-conditioned places are so widely and freely available. Uh, uh, it, it may have been seen in the past around here, but uh, because it does get very hot and people get dehydrated. Uh, we see it sometimes in people who run marathons and play, you know, a, a sport like tennis, they don't drink enough uh, appropriate juices. Some of them will drink only water and they get hyponatremic. They need to have a new electrolyte solution for a balance. Uh, 
and and some of them like uh, we recommend Gatorade quite often it has a lot of sugar so it's a problem for people with diabetes so in india actually heat exhaustion is a major issue and uh, now heat exhaustion uh, heat stroke of key, of course means that you have come in unconscious but heat exhaustion also doesn't have to be diagnosed only after you have become unconscious one can diagnose it earlier so it is very common in india even the average physician each and every one who is listening to you today will uh, report that towards the end of an opd towards the end of a busy clinic uh, cognitive function begins to go down patience begins to go down something called compassion fatigue begins to set in now either that can be because of neuroglycopenia that means there is less glucose in your brain or it can be because of less sodium in your brain less less salt or it can be because of less water in your body all these will cause irritation lack of concentration so the best way of course is to prevent it so take adequate water take adequate electrolytes and the second best way if you've not been able to do that is to treat it uh, sir we are lucky in india we have multiple preparations so one is enerzel 0 which is uh, an iso um, electrolyte isotonic uh, energy solution uh, we advise that to people with diabetes uh, and and the common situations where we would advise it would be heat exhaustion pre exercise drinking or pre workout drinking and then post workout drinking this is for people with diabetes whose glucose is well managed we have another drink and we saw the video in the morning it's just uh, an hour ago that is enerzel blitz blue color now now blue is beautiful because blue is the color of diabetes as well the international diabetes federation has chosen blue as its logo and enerzel blitz uh, contains one third the calories that coca cola or limca contain so just one third the calories so that is also okay if your patient's glucose levels are maybe on the lower side or the lower side of common and of course if glucose levels are very low one has hypoglycemia then a good preparation that we have is enerzel which contains a uh, adequate amount of calories sir even more questions coming up for you uh, our audience is not done with you yet and a question coming from dr pradeep talwarkar now this is a tough question he says sir we are aware of the concept of glycemic memory in india we use the term glycemic karma or karam or metabolic karma or karam to explain what had happened in the past what impact it has on the present and we also use the concept of metabolic karma to motivate our patients to follow good karma or good advice today so that they can influence their future in a healthy manner but his question is is there proof for bad lipid memory speaking only about lipids because he says uh, i have seen lot of type 2 diabetes patients in their 50s and 60s with advanced macrovascular disease polyvascular disease even though their ldl has been quite low why is it that these people have developed macrovascular polyvascular disease in spite of a good ldl so that's a very good question i i think you need to recognize that uh LDL explains only about half the cardiovascular disease. So a large number of MIs occur in people with a normal LDL level. So uh, and again, it brings up the question: What is a normal LDL? Uh, you can bring down an LDL down to hardly anything, almost zero, with a PCSK9 inhibitor without any any problem. So, what is the role of LDL uh, in, in the circulation? It's, it's it's somewhat problematic. Take the, I I think this concept of memory has been quite widely accepted. There's something to it. However, I want to point out one important issue, in that once a complication has established structural abnormality in the blood vessels, in it is essentially irreversible. You cannot take it away, and that is. part of what the memory issue is all about so you go for 20 years of not taking care of yourself you establish complications and suddenly you want to change your karma it's just not possible so some things are modifiable otherwise than others are not and others might be in the middle too late if it's it's yeah, too, late. too late you you look at the example of the look ahead study you took people very late and you improved everything but they did not have a benefit I, on the hard end points dr swapnil has a question related to look ahead uh, let's take this question in two parts his first question is diet versus exercise 
Of course, both are important, but what is their relative importance when we are managing someone with diabetes and or obesity? So that, that, that's a very good question. It is almost impossible to lose weight with exercise alone. I think I, I, I immediately people say, I'm not losing weight. I go to the gym every day now. You will not. It is impossible for you to uh, develop enough of a calorie deficit just by exercise. You'll have to exercise so much that the average person cannot do it. So you do need the diet. Diet is very, very important in, in, in terms of weight loss. Exercise has a tremendous benefit in terms of insulin sensitivity and improving glucose control. So that depends on what you want. So uh, Dr. Swapnil, for weight loss, diet would be better. Of course, both are important. The advantage of exercising is that you will not lose muscle mass. So you will not yes. develop sarcopenia, especially if you're on the older side, maybe the wrong side of 40. Uh, so uh, that is important. Uh, but if you were to choose one, then diet would be more important. At the same time, if it is for glucose control that you're trying, and if someone has a lot of insulin resistance, then certainly when you move those muscles, then the insulin receptors in, in the muscles, they become more sensitive to whatever medication you're trying. Uh, we'll continue with this question. Now, his second question is, let's focus on exercise alone, sir. Uh, which activity would be the best? What should we recommend to the average Indian? It's whatever you can do. Anything. Anything is good. There's lots, always debate comes up. Is it better to do aerobic or anaerobic or resistance training or non-resistant training? It doesn't matter. It, not exercising is bad. Anything. Uh, one of my friends is Dr. Navneet Agarwal. He is a consultant diabetologist at Gwalior, sir, in Madhya Pradesh. So he taught me the concept of temple therapy. So what does temple therapy mean? So he meets the patient and he tells her, Madam, I've written this medication and it is going to work. It's going to do wonders in you. There is only one catch. The catch is that you have to go to such and such a temple every day and you have to go on foot. And he chooses a temple which is about one and a half to two kilometers away. So uh, the patient begins going there and then lo and behold, after six weeks, her hb one is much better. And then Dr. Namit changes the temple therapy and then he says, okay, now see, you've got whatever blessings you wanted to get from that temple. Now, why don't you try this other temple, which is located four kilometers away from you? Again, you have to go on foot. So this is uh, another way of motivating your patients to exercise. For some people, it may be looking good, cosmetic. For others, it may be just a good glucose number. And for yet others, you might wish to use religion or culture or societal pressure as a way of exercising. Just don't make it appear like pressure. Just, you know, give a very diplomatic nudge here and there. Uh, so we are mindful of time. Uh, and just one or two more questions. Dr. Shishir from Maharashtra says, is diabetes reversal possible? And what are the exact English words that you use in your practice? To so uh, I, I, it is possible. The term that is being used is remission. Uh, and obviously the classic way to induce remission is through bariatric surgery, but there's a very nice study called the addition study done in England, where they gave people low calorie diets relatively early in their diabetes and got them off medications. Uh, so it is, it is certainly is possible, but you've got to maintain that weight loss long-term. Dr. Uh, Shishir, uh, we appreciate your question because many patients ask us this. So an ABCDE formula for you, if the age is lesser, if the body weight or BMI is more, if the C-peptide is adequate, that means pancreatic function is adequate. And if the duration of diabetes is less, and E is for energy, enthusiasm, education of the patient, as well as the treating physician, if ABCD are in favor, then there is a chance of a remission. The correct word to use would be remission. Uh, two more questions, sir, if you allow. Dr. Samir Singhal says, uh, is cranial neuropathy in diabetes reversible? Do you see optic neuropathy frequently? Uh, it's quite rare. You can get mononeuritis, uh, as mono so it can be part of the mononeuritis, but it's not common. And Dr. Samir, we do see conditions like malignant uh, otitis externa, pyelonephritis. These are part and parcel of uh, Indian diabetes practice. Actually, as an Indian physician, Dr. Singhal is from UP. We have to handle two hats, two, wear two turbans at the same time, acute care and chronic care. Actually, that is why sometimes it becomes more challenging for us. You, the same person is handling both at the same time in the same patient. Dr. Snehal says uh, she's from Maharashtra. She queries, 
if i use too much of electrolytes is there can any side effects occur too much of uh, zero calorie energy drinks so the only potential risk risk is in people with kidney disease they might have get, get hyperkalemia but otherwise it's not an issue so i know uh, obviously sodium sodium intake as well your total yeah. sodium intake if it is high will lead to it may not be immediate but you ultimately get hypertension so anyone uh, snehal with maybe congestive cardiac failure someone who is uh, decompensated or somebody with chronic kidney disease like dr vegan has said in such patients we should be mindful we should be careful otherwise uh, it really won't matter in india and you can use this safely many times in my opd i have patients who come in with ghabrahat now now it's very difficult to diagnose ghabrahat or in kannada they will say sustu susti so a feeling of uneasiness a feeling of energy a n e r g y feeling of lack of well being you really don't know how to diagnose it now now should i investigate should i refer the patient so sometimes what i do is i tell them to sit for uh, 15 20 minutes in the opd take a bottle of enerzel or enerzel blitz 200 ml and uh, ask them how they are feeling after some time if they are feeling better usually it is uh, something temporary and they've taken care of it themselves if they are worse if their chest pain is worse their discomfort is worse then we go ahead and investigate sir we've had a great time with you today uh, a question from uh, all the audience how is uh, your day been so far with us with the indian audience my day is just start my very very good i enjoyed it my day is just starting i need to go into the hospital now and see somebody uh, yeah, sure. but uh, it, they the, it's morning here but i'm very been very pleased to be with all of you today and look forward to for their interaction we like to thank you sir and uh, you've actually proven why you are known as the dronacharya of diabetes across the world uh, dr basu please so sir uh, i think uh, we have uh, had a wonderful session and a day with dr vivian fonseca interviewed by dr sanjay kalra and that's the beginning of our diabetes essential 52 weeks with dr sanjay kalra and we thank dr vivian fonseca for giving his time and a wonderful lecture we also would like to have him in coming sessions because in a year we bring three external faculties from the western world to give what's happening in their world so that we also are connected with the more number of physicians and diabetologists and general physicians who are treating almost 10 crores of diabetic people in india So, sir, uh, with this we end of our session today. And uh, every Sunday at 9 p.m., we will see most of our colleagues joining with Dr. Sanjay Kalra. Have a good day, and uh, thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Very good. Bye bye. Bye.